Hey friends, this is Miss Betterton. I just read two whole chapters, almost, and then a phone call came through, and I don't know what happened. I thought that I had put Do Not Disturb on my phone, so then it just kicked me off. So, I'm gonna have to start all over. I'm sorry for not being here the last few days. Um, I just recorded all this, so I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I ended up going up to Oklahoma after the last time we read and I didn't have time and I was having so much fun with friends and my son and his wife so I didn't have time to read while I was up there I had four or five days without reading well reading Jack and Annie anyway so I apologize I know I left you hanging at a very crazy spot and so we're going to read chapter five high in the sky today when the doors opened Roberto led Jack and Annie off the tram. They walked down a ramp from the station and headed into the huge parking area. Aztec Stadium is named for the people who built an empire, an empire in this part of Mexico many hundreds of years ago, said Roberto. Really, said Jack. He read about the Aztec Empire. He could imagine the enormous stadium being similar to an Aztec pyramid. Thousands of spectators flooded the parking lot. They wore bright summer clothes and wide-brimmed hats. Vendors walked among the big cars selling Brazilian, Italian, and Mexican flags. Kids were waving souvenir programs, soccer shirts, and caps for sale. Jack and Annie followed Roberto to the nearest entrance, and Annie held out their two tickets. That way, Gate G, a stadium official said, he pointed toward one of the other entries, entrances. When Roberto showed his ticket, the man pointed in the same direction. Hurry, I hope I'm sitting next near near to you, said Roberto. Me too, said Jack. All right, so here they are getting into the stadium. Lots and lots of people. Love going to sports events. Jack, Annie, and Roberto followed a crowd through Gate G and into the giant stadium. They all looked up at the stands. Dozens of tiers of seats rose above the green soccer field. The rows were so steep it looked as if spectators in the highest rows might fall straight down onto the field. This place is huge, said Jack. Where do we go now, said Annie. My father said I should ask an official, said Roberto, looking around. Over there. He led Jack and Annie to an usher in uniform standing at the bottom of an aisle. Can you please tell us where our seats are? Annie asked, showing her tickets to the woman. When the woman looked at the ticket, her eyes grew wide. You have some of the best seats in the stadium, she said. She pointed to the section closest to the field. Over there, second row, right on the aisle. Yay, said Jack. The guard at the embassy had been right. They did have incredible seats. That would help them get close enough to Pele to learn a secret of greatness from him. Jack turned excitedly to Roberto. Where's your seat, he asked. Roberto showed his ticket to the usher. Where do I go? He asked. Well, you were in the same line as your friends, the woman told Roberto. Fantastic, he said with a big grin. But I'm afraid your seat is in a different section, said the usher. She pointed all the way up. It's near the very top high in the sky. The smile left Roberto's face, but then it returned. I'd better go, he said. It was great to meet you. You too, said Jack. Goodbye, Jack and Annie, said Roberto, and he started up the steep steps to the top of the stadium. Roberto, wait, Annie called, and she hurried up the steps after him. Jack followed her. Listen, I want to trade seats with you, she said. She held out her ticket. Really, thought Jack. What about our mission? Oh, no, I cannot, said Roberto. Yes, you can, said Annie. Please, we have to trade seats. But why, asked Roberto. Because it's your birthday, said Annie, and if you have a good seat, you can tell your eight brothers and sisters and your parents all about the game. So it'll be like 11 people are getting a good seat, not just one. That actually makes sense, thought Jack. Still, he was amazed by Annie's generosity. But no, I cannot, said Roberto. But yes, you can, said Annie. <clears throat> she grabbed Roberto's ticket and put her own ticket in his hand. You guys have fun. She started up the stairs. Jack felt a wave of guilt. Wait, stop. That's not fair, he said to Annie. Maybe I should give up my seat. No, it's okay. I'll give up mine, said Annie. Roberto laughed. You are both too kind, he said. I cannot take 
either of your seats. Roberto handed Annie her ticket and took his back. No, please, I want, Annie protested. Wait, I have another idea, Jack said to Annie. We can take turns. I'll switch with Roberto for the first half and you switch with him for the second half. Perfect, said Annie. That way, Roberto can get a great view of the whole game and you and I will get to get a great view for half the time. Right, Jack pulled the ring of truth off his finger. He slipped it into Annie's hand and spoke softly to her. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the person who's sitting close to the field should wear this. Be sure to check it if you think you've discovered Pele's secret. Got it, Annie said, putting the ring on her finger. I'll give it back to you at halftime. Right, said Jack. How long is halftime, Roberto? Fifteen minutes. Plenty of time, said Jack. He looked at his seat number, A26. Okay, I'll find you an A26, Annie. Wait for me. Then he swapped tickets with, with Roberto. Thank you a million times, Jack, said Roberto. No problem, said Jack. See you guys later. And he started up the stairs. Have fun in the sky, called Annie. I will. Jack felt great as he started up the steps to the top of the stands. He was sure he'd done the right thing, especially since it was Roberto's birthday. But as Jack climbed higher and higher, his spirits fell. The stands were so high, he wondered if he'd be able to see anything. By the time he reached the top rows, he was out of breath. He showed his ticket to an usher, and she pointed toward his seat. Jack squeezed past people and collapsed on the bench. From his seat, the field looked like a million miles away. How can anyone enjoy the game from up here, he wondered. He wished huge stadium screens had been invented so everyone could see the game well. The spectators around Jack seemed to be having a good time anyway. A couple and their two children were eating tacos and drinking sodas. Others were waving small multicolored flags. A teenage boy next to Jack was looking through a pair of large binoculars. A man with a bushy mustache held a scratchy sounding portable radio. Jack could hear the sportscaster through the static. Final World Cup Championship. A billion people around the world are watching on television. And over a hundred thousand spectators are here in Aztec Stadium today. Here they come, shouted the boy looking through binoculars. Suddenly, all the spectators let out a roar. The two soccer teams were running onto the field. Italy's incredible team has blue shirts and white shorts, the teenager with binoculars shouted. Brazil's beautiful team, yellow shirts and blue shorts. Pele is number 10. Jack couldn't see the numbers of any uniforms, much less any numbers. Kickoff and there Pele goes, the commentator on the crackly radio yelled. Pele, there, there, where, where, Jack wondered. He really wanted to see Pele the Great, but from his seat high up in the sky, the players on the field looked no bigger than ants. The radio commentator shouted excitedly about the game. Jack could only catch pieces of what he was saying. What a pass! Carlos Alberto, captain of Brazil's team, hitting a very long ball. Dangerous free kick situation. Italy zero, Brazil zero. With every play, someone in the huge stadium screamed, whistled, cheered, or booed. Then thousands of Brazil, Brazil fans jumped to their feet, pumping their fists in the air and screaming, Go! Jack jumped to his feet, too. The teenager with the binoculars shouted, Pele leapt past the defender. He hit the ball and scored. Jack shook his head. He couldn't believe he'd miss seeing Pele make a, go make a goal. He really wished he had binoculars. He really, really wished he were sitting with Annie and Roberto. Everyone sat down. Jack listened as carefully as he could to the voice of the radio commentator. Free kick, way, way up. Beautiful. No wonder Brazil is called the beautiful team. Punching that one away. Dead ball. Nothing the sportscaster said sounded like a secret of greatness to Jack. He just hoped Annie was paying close attention to the game and checking the ring a lot. Even though he was envious, Jack was still glad that Roberto had a great view of the game. If he was sitting up here, Jack thought, he'd have nothing to report to his eight brothers and sisters. Suddenly, thousands of Italy fans leapt to their feet, screaming, and the older kid with binoculars shouted, Italy scores! Brazil won! Italy won! Jack couldn't wait to switch seats with Annie and watch the game up close. If the ring hadn't glowed for her, it would all be up to him. As soon as the radio announcer said halftime, Jack looked at his watch. It was 12.45. 
He had 15 minutes to find Annie and Roberto. Jack squeezed past the people sitting in his row and took off down the mountain of stairs. So there he goes. Lots and lots of people. Do you think he's going to find Annie? I sure hope he is. Well, hey, that's all the time I have today to read. So tomorrow we will pick up and we'll, we will read uh, chapter six. It's called Annie, Roberto. He's looking for him. So I hope that you have enjoyed this chapter. And I know that Jack will be able to find Annie and Roberto, hopefully. And hopefully he'll be able to see more of the game. All right. We'll read some more tomorrow. Talk to you later. Bye.